want to talk today about what good readers do to help them understand what they're reading. We've been talking a lot about that, and one of the things that we've decided that good readers always do is they're always thinking when they're reading. And one of the things that it's really important to think about as you read is what the author is writing about, so the topic, and the other thing is the main idea. And I've put these on a chart for you today so you can keep referring to them. Lots of times people get these confused, what the topic and the main idea is. Even adults confuse these sometimes. So listen carefully while we go through this. The topic is like the subject. Okay? You ask yourself the question, who or what is this about? Often the answer to that question is going to be your topic. Okay? Sometimes it's only one or two words, quite often. Okay? When we talk about main idea, the main idea is what the author is trying to tell us. So if you ask the question, what does the author want me to understand about that topic, that's going to give you your main idea. Okay, so that's the difference between topic and main idea. Now I'd like to give you an example that's not in the book to start with so that you can think about this. If you came into the room this morning and all of your friends were standing back in the corner here and they were talking and you heard your name mentioned three or four times in the conversation, you'd probably go like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And somebody might say, we're talking about you. All right. So now you know the topic of their conversation, but is that enough information? No. Probably not. You'd probably be feeling, if it were me, I'd be feeling like, I wonder what they're saying about me. I know I'm the topic, but what are they saying? And that's why we need to know a main idea. If they tell you what they're talking about, that's the main idea. And hopefully it's something really good about you, right? It's the same when you read a book. Okay? If you know the topic of the book, or the topic of the paragraph, or the topic of the passage that you're reading, that's good information, but it's not enough. You need to be able to understand the main idea as well as the topic. Last week we looked at this book. Remember we did a talk about the writing and we wrote about how to take care of different types of pets. And we looked at this book and we knew right away the book was about horses from the cover. But as we looked inside the table of contents, there were lots of different things going on about horses. And when we read pages 12 and 13, before we did our writing, we decided together that these pages were about horse care, how to care for a horse. And that was pretty simple. Caring for horses was the subtitle, so we figured it out pretty easy. And then as we read on, the first sentence said, caring for a horse is hard work. And as we read through the rest of the passage, we decided that that was the main idea that this author wanted us to know about this book. All right? So the topic was horse care, but the main idea was that caring for a horse is hard work. And after we finished reading this, Jordan said to me, well, yes, but Mrs. Kindercheck, that was an easy one because it told you the topic and the subtitle, and it told you the main idea in the first sentence. <coughs> Sometimes books don't do that. What do I do? How do I figure it out if the book doesn't do it? So that's what I wanted to show you today. I wanted to show you how I think when I'm trying to figure out the topic and the main idea. So I went and found this book. This one's by Bobby Coleman, who's one of my favorite authors that we look at a lot. And this one's called Frogs and Toads. So what I'd like to do with frogs and toads is let you hear the thinking that's going on inside my brain as I decide what the topic is that the author is talking about and what the main idea or the author's message is. All right? So I'm going to read a little bit, and then you'll hear me thinking about what I'm when I'm trying to figure that out. All right. I'm going to read the passage for you. I have it on an overhead so that you can see the pictures at the same time, and then after I've read the passage, we'll go back and I'll let you hear my friend of the frog, and this is where I'm starting to read. And this will just be two short pages, 
The subtitle is Eardrums. Look for the ears on this frog. Believe it or not, almost all frogs and toads have ears. Their ears are very different from the ears of other animals. Frog and toad ears are called tympanums. The tympanum is a thin layer of skin. It does not stick out from the head, and there is no pull. Sound bounces off the tympanum in the same way a drumstick hits a drum. The frog hears by feeling the bounce. Male frogs have larger tympanums than female frogs, and frogs have larger tympanums than toad. So what was I thinking as I was reading that? First thing I was thinking is, what's this about? I know the book is about frogs and toads, but I also could tell from looking at the table of contents in this book, and I'll just show it to you. It says at the top, what's in this book? Okay, so it tells me that there's lots of different things about frogs and toads in this book. So what was this page all about? And the first thing I thought about is when I read that, I heard the word ears mentioned several times. Okay? I want you to count them for me, and I'm going to read those first three or four sentences. Just use your fingers and count for me. Eardrums. Look for the ears on this frog. Believe it or not, almost all frogs and toads have ears. Their ears are very different from the ears of other animals. Frog and toad ears are called tympanums. How many times did you hear the word ears? Jared. Some of you heard it too. Any more? Alicia? You heard it five times. Do you know what? I think that's how many times I heard it. I heard it five times in the sentences. And I also saw it once in the subtitle of the word ears. It's a compound word, eardrums, but it's still there. When an author uses a key word like that many times in the passage, they're often <coughs> trying to give us a clue about what the topic is. So that was my first clue. I started thinking about that. Then I looked at the first sentence, and it seemed like the author was pointing me to something right away. She says, look for the ears on this frog. And that's pretty clear what she wants us to look at. The second sentence says, believe it or not, almost all frogs and toads have ears. So by now I'm ready to ask myself this question. I'm thinking, who or what is this about? And I decided in my mind that the author is telling me about the ears of frogs and toads, or frogs and toad ears. Okay? So the next question I need to ask myself then is, what does this author want me to know about frog and toad ears? And that's what I've got to think about next. So I'm going back to the book again. And the first thing I notice, I'm just going to browse on the pages. And take a look here. I notice this drum. And do you see the little blue with the lines coming out of there? Those are like sound waves coming out of the drum when the drum stick hits it. And I browse over to this side, I see the frog. And do you see the little circle on the side of his face there? Yeah. And there's little sound waves, blue waves coming out again. Look at the picture of the frog up here. Look how big this circle is. It seems to me that's important. They didn't take a picture of the frog from the front where I can see it. They took it from the side. Well, look how prominent this circle is. It takes up a lot of the page. So I know that's important there too. The next thing I noticed was that on this page, at the bottom, there was a word in bold, dark print. And we know that we've looked at these a lot. We know that authors, when they have something important, that they're trying to teach us a new word, or it's an important word, or a key word, they'll often put it either in bold print or italicis. And so I knew this word was important right away. Tympanums. I wasn't sure yet what it meant because the definition was on the next page, but I was thinking about when I was in high school and I was in the band, we had a drum in high school and it was called a timpani. And the word was spelled very close to this word. And I started thinking about that because of the picture of the drum. I knew there might be a connection there. Okay, so that was one of the clues I looked at. The next thing I started to think 
about was, I wonder what this author wants me to understand about that. So I went back to the book and I looked at it again. And thinking about how important the word tympanum is, that they put it in bold print, I read the rest of this page, okay? And listen to what it says about the tympanum. The tympanum is a thin layer of skin. Okay, so I'm thinking about that layer of skin, and I'm thinking about the layer of skin on the drum. When we hit the drum, we hear the sound, right? And then I'm looking again, and I'll just put the frog down here for a minute, and I'm thinking about, this almost looks like a drum, isn't it? The tip of on the side of his face. It doesn't stick out from the head, and there's no hole. So Jared, our ears stick out, right, from our head. We have a hole in our ears. The frog's doesn't. It's tight like the skin of a drum. The next thing it says is that sound bounces off the tympanum in the same way that the drumstick hits the drum. So there's that connection that I was making from the drum called the tympany to the frog's ear called the tympanum. The frog hears by feeling the bounce. And notice the word hears. There it is right there. This in quotation marks. And they've done that because the frog really doesn't hear. Okay? It's like he's hearing, but his way of hearing is feeling the bounce. So they use those quotation marks there to let us know that. Then it says, male frogs have larger tympanums than female frogs, and frogs have larger tympanums than toads. Alright? Those last seven sentences are all about the tympanum. They're all about how the frog hears. And that's one of the things I know about main idea. When the author's trying to give us a message, they'll often try to give us the message and then give us a whole bunch of details about what that main idea is. So now I think I'm ready to answer this question. What does the author want me to understand about frog and toad ears? I think that this author wants me to understand that frogs and toads hear differently than other animals, and that they hear through something called a tympanum. Now, did you see all of the thinking that I did, all that background thinking I did to figure out what the topic and main idea are? Sometimes when I'm reading, I'll read two or three pages, and it could be a book at night or something, and maybe I'm tired, and I get to the end of the two or three pages, and I think, what did I just read? I don't have a clue what I just read because I wasn't thinking as I was reading. And that probably has happened to you sometimes where you've read something in school and then you go, your mind wanders off and you're not thinking. So you know how important it is to always be thinking as you read. And this is one of the first things that you should always think about. What is the author trying to tell me? What's the topic? So ask yourself, where, what is this about? And then ask yourself, what's the author's message? Why did they bother writing this? And what do they want me to understand? All right? So when we go to the books today, I'm going to ask you to choose a good nonfiction book. I'm going to ask you to find a good passage, like I did in this Bobby Cullum book. And as you read, these are the two questions you're going to ask yourself. Okay? Look for evidence of what the main idea is like I do. Look for the supporting details. Look for the clues. Maybe there's a gold print or italicis or maps or charts to help you. And when you've got your evidence collected and you're ready to share your thinking with me,